This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay. Good morning. As people are logging in, go ahead and get going. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. This is our second to last uh, conference of the year. Um, our speaker today, as you can see on the screen, is Dr. Stephen Rogers. Uh, Stephen is uh, a I guess he's in his fourth year of fellowship in our ABIM research track in his first clinical year. Uh, Stephen is from Arkansas, did his undergraduate studies in medical school at the University of Arkansas, came to Emory for residency as part of our combined uh, uh, research track. Um, and he is going to talk about uh, a topic near and dear to my heart, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, specifically apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So take it away, Stephen. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to go through this case uh, today. So this is a case actually was pretty recent uh, while I was um, going through on service at the VA CCU. Um, and also apologize in advance for any ill-behaved dog noises here in this remote setting. So just put that out there. Um, so the yeah the title of the talk today is apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the ace of spades. Um, I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures to add to this. Um, so today outline goals I'm just gonna kind of go through the case today give some imaging um, that's associated with the case uh, a little background on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, covers some of the more salient points of the apical variant variety of this um, disease, discuss some therapies, um, some guidelines that are maybe more specific to this variant, and then some potential future direction. So this uh, gentleman, a 62-year-old male, comes into the VA ED. Um, he had been working out at the gym. Uh, says that he works out pretty consistently four to six times per week um, and complained of palpitations, chest discomfort, and some lightheadedness that was kind of off and on while he was working out. Um, went home and continued to have these symptoms, um, even tried to go shopping and uh, continued to have uh, more symptoms, and so decided to present to the emergency room. Um, and then upon arrival to the emergency room, he's actually, from a you know triage standpoint, was fairly stable, but then very quickly after arrival, uh, began to experience the same symptoms that he had uh, in the gym and afterwards, um, became lightheaded, diaphoretic. Uh, the triage nurse got an EKG, um, and the triage doctor uh, examined the EKG and showed that it was um, ventricular tachycardia with rates into about the 230s. Patient was noted to be progressively more hypotensive with MAPS down into the 50s to 60s, um, and so was quickly taken back and uh, successfully cardioverted. Um, he was started on amiodarone drip and then, uh, then went to the CCU for further monitoring and evaluation and management. So some kind of pertinent, you know, recent kind of clinical history for this patient. Um, he was seen as recently as 2021 um, in the cardiology clinic at an outpatient setting for palpitations. Uh, Holter monitor at that time showed some very low AFib burden, uh, rare NSVT episodes um, that were ranging from like five to 10 beats. Um, he had an echo done at that time that was pretty unremarkable. He had a normal EF, some very mild LVH, normal RV, um, nothing really that was um, extremely, um, you know, eye-popping at that time. So he was started on a beta blocker um, and kind of looking through the notes, seems like he kind of self-weaned his beta blocker due to um, some issues with not being able to get his heart rate up very high um, at times in the gym. Um, and so over the year or so, kind of down, you know, decreases dose to 12.5 milligrams BID. Um, and during that year or so, he said he had very rare episodes of these kind of palpitations and, and no further symptoms. And even more recently in March of this year, um, he came in with some dizziness, lightheadedness, and had uh, AFib with RVR that he was, uh, you know, quickly admitted for and, and discharged after he underwent uh, successful cardioversion at that time. Uh, 
Um, a TEE, a TTE at that time also showed mild to moderate LVH, some grade one diastolic dysfunction and mildly dilated left atrium. So some more pertinent medical history. Um, so as I mentioned, he's had paroxysmal AFib. It's a fairly new diagnosis for him. Also a remote history of unprovoked PE. Um, he's got hypertension that's been very well controlled, HIV that's also very well controlled, non-detectable, um, and CKD3. Uh, he's a very healthy guy at baseline, as mentioned, with his exercise activity. He also denies tobacco, alcohol, and illicit drug use. Didn't have a surgical history. Family history, pertinent for cardiology uh, diseases. He said that he had a sister with some type of cardiomyopathy, but really couldn't be very much more clear on that. Was maybe she had a device or something in place, but wasn't exactly sure. Otherwise, no other family history of sudden cardiac death or anything else that was very pertinent. Uh, his medications at the time are amlodipine, five milligrams, Eliquis, BID for his. Uh, uh, AFib and PE history, metoprotrate, uh, 12 and a half BID, resuvastatin, and Devado for his uh, antiretroviral for HIV. So on arrival to the ED, um, as I mentioned before, when he first arrived, he's hemodynamically stable, asymptomatic, but then quickly developed uh, this VT uh, with a heart rate in the 230s, blood pressure, um, 89 over 62, normal oxygen levels on room air, BMI was 29. Um, on exam, really nothing very significant. Uh, no murmurs, no lower extremity edema. Um, pulmonary exam was uh, unremarkable. Notable labs on arrival, his uh, troponin, initial troponin was 0.56. Uh, he had a mild AKI from a creatinine of 2.1, where his baseline is about 1.4 to 1.6. His electrolytes were within normal limits of a K4 and MAG of 2.1 and a normal CBC and a normal TSH. So this is the triage EKG that was obtained during his episode um, that he, when he became dizzy and lightheaded. As you can see, you have a wide complex tachycardia um, in the rates of 240. He was, as I said, after this episode, cardioverted, um, we have another EKG that was approximately, I'd say about three or four hours after the cardioversion. Um, and this EKG, we can see a you know, very mild first degree AV block. So maybe some um, kind of borderline T abnormalities, especially in the lateral leads, um, but otherwise, and maybe also some low voltage in uh, inferior leads three and AVF. So his first 24 hours, um, as far as his clinical course goes, overnight he was on the amiodarone drip. Um, he had multiple episodes of monomorphic and SVT with the longest um, episode lasting 24 beats. At that time, he was asymptomatic, uh, no drop in blood pressure at any point during the evening. His initial troponin, as I mentioned, was 0.56. It climbed to 2.67, five hours after the shock, and then peaked at 10, 13 hours post-shock. Uh, later on in the morning, after we arrived for rounds, we did a bedside echo. Um, it appeared to be a fairly a little bit difficult windows, but normal EF, um, maybe a possible subtle inferior wall hypokinesis, but nothing extremely remarkable other than the possible inferior wall um, abnormality. But given uh, significant troponin elevation, uh, the ST abnormalities that were in the post EKG, post uh, cardioversion EKG, and the bedside echo um, in the setting of monomorphic VT, we decided to take him for a left heart cath for further evaluation. So, this first view, the areocaudal view here, uh, we can see a fairly unremarkable coronary angiogram here, left main looks good, the left circumflex um, has no significant obstruction there, he has a small left ramus that fills nicely, I mean, was, yeah, sorry, a ramus that fills there. Um, in the cranial view here, we can see the LAD uh, down to the apex there, no significant obstruction, might note a hint of maybe a little bit of sluggish flow in the LAD, but otherwise um, fairly unremarkable. So no significant 
uh, obstructive coronary disease in the left circulation. And then taking a look at the RCA, again, no major coronary obstructive disease here. So all in all, fairly unremarkable coronary angiography with this guy. So over the next 24 hours, uh, the patient was transitioned from an amiodarone drip to uh, beta blocker therapy, even took a while to tartrate 25 TID um, in discussion with EP for possible um, EP study later on in the week. Um, his NSVT burden had significantly reduced um, over the, the past 24 hours down to two episodes, longest being five beats. Um, and again, completely asymptomatic and, and no uh, fluctuations in blood pressure. So the next step we took was to get a formal TTE um, and then considering uh, cardiac MRI for further evaluation of VT, possible scar burden, um, other etiologies that might be causing this, uh, this rhythm disorder. So this um, first view here, uh, this is just taking a look at the four chamber apical view. Um, we can see here that he's got normal EF, uh, but he's got what looks like a pretty large degree of uh, hypertrophy that's particularly present down in the apex of the heart. And so in the contrasted study here in the next slide, we can again see that fairly large degree of hypertrophy down in the apex. And then also there's kind of a, looks like a subtle hint of maybe an aneurysm that's also there present when we're seeing kind of the, the fan through with the probe um, down in the apex as well. And so the next step we took was to get that cardiac MRI. Um, and so in this view, this is down towards the kind of the apical level of the left ventricle. And you can just kind of appreciate the amount of hypertrophy that's down um, at this level here on the cardiac MRI. And then in the next step here, we take a look at the two chamber view and we can really see not only does the left apex appear hypertrophied, but he's also got a fairly significant um, aneurysm that's also present. And this picture quality unfortunately didn't pan out. It looks fairly compressed, but if we can appreciate here, uh, this is the late gadolinium enhancement phase of the study. Um, and as you can notice here, we've got some enhancement that's uh, confined primarily to the apex um, and pretty, pretty diffuse um, throughout the entire apex, uh, suggestive of a fairly large amount of uh, potential scar burden there. That's also associated with the region of the aneurysm. And so looking through all this, this is all of his kind of uh, imaging and presentation are all kind of pointing towards uh, an apical variant of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an associated apical aneurysm and fairly large scar burden. Uh, and so in discussion with the EP team uh, at the VA, we decided to up titrate his beta blocker to um, treat his uh, ventricular tachycardia. So we increased that to 100 milligrams daily. Um, we had a discussion with the patient about ICD options and the patient was agreeable. Um, and so over the next 24 hours, NSVT burden was also very, very well controlled. Only one episode, very you know, short beats of six beats uh, during that time. Um, and then, so given the new evidence of this uh, apical aneurysm in the setting of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and large scar burden, um, EP elected for medical therapy um, and 
decided to uh, forgo the EP study with ablation. Um, the next kind of plan for medical management, if we had breakthrough VT, it would have been to move to soda law at that time. And so the final 24 hours, a patient uh, underwent ICD implantation. Um, was very successful, no uh, complications with that procedure. He had no further VT episodes over the last 24 hours um, and was discharged on the 100 milligrams of um, beta blocker therapy of metoprolol XL uh, with follow-up to be done in the EP and general cardiology outpatient clinic. We also discussed the need for counseling for any family members. Um, he has no children, but has multiple siblings. And in coming to talk to him more about his, uh, his sister, it sounds like she potentially had, had some uh, significant cardiomyopathy that also required a defibrillator in her late 40s as well. Still not entirely sure exactly what the exact etiology of, of that cardiomyopathy was. And so to cover some background related to this case, um, so just in general, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is fairly heterogeneous disease um, characterized by LVH, um, significant LVH in the absence of any other explainable cardiac, systemic, or metabolic disease that would be capable of producing the same magnitude of hypertrophy. Um, it's inherited in an autosomal, uh, autosomal dominant pattern, um, typically with fairly equal sex distribution. Um, the histological features include uh, the myocyte hypertrophy, disarray of myocytes, also interstitial fibrosis uh, related to this evolution. And then and the majority of patients has a fairly benign course, um, but as we know, that it's definitely associated with um, sudden cardiac death, heart failure, and then eventual morbidity related to that. And just the simple biology behind, uh, you know, the contraction of cardiomyocytes, we talk about the thin filaments, the active filaments, and the interaction with the myosin filaments that results in the uh, contraction of the cardiomyocyte. Um, and the genes that are associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy revolve around alterations, mutations in the coding of these proteins. Um, and, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes now kind of implicated and discovered in, in this uh, heterogeneous uh, pathology. But by far and away, the, the more common uh, alterations are in the MYBPC3 gene and the MYH7 gene that are associated with the uh, myosin thick filaments. And among, as I said, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotypes, uh, the most common, um, you know, phenotypes are associated with the septal hypertrophy, either in the sigmoidal or reverse curve hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype. And then, of course, the apical, which is somewhere around the 10% um, of the cases of hypertrophy and then the neutral um, phenotype. And when discussing the apical variety, um, literature kind of breaks them down into you know, different places, kind of list different things, but uh, there's a pure variety and a mixed variety. Pure variety is um, kind of a normal uh, free wall and septal um, uh, depth or you know uh thickness of the uh the the um of the free wall on the septum where and then isolated pure apical um hypertrophy and this can occur with and without aneurysm versus the mixed um apical variety which not only has the apical hypertrophy but also associated either free wall or septal um hypertrophy particularly in the mid cavitary region And so where the title of this talk uh, gets its origin here is it was kind of described as the uh, ace of spades variety because of its uh, kind of, you know, prototypical shape noted on, on both the echo and the uh, left ventricular gram. Um, you can see this kind of very strong tapering um, in the kind of mid cavitary region down into the apex where you have this large amount of hypertrophy, which gives it this distinctive shape. 
also what you know it's considered pathognomonic or very strongly associated with uh apical variety is the very giant uh, T wave inversions that are associated on EKG patterns. So in the kind of pure apical variety, we have you know large voltage uh, criteria that would meet LVH associated with giant negative symmetric deep T wave inversions, notably in the precordial and inferolateral leads. Um, more recently, as you know, this has been studied more and more. We've noted that these T waves can also it can kind of evolve over time and even um, kind of disappear over time through the natural progression of the disease. Um, and in, you know, in the past, we thought that this was kind of presented as at least 50% of cases would be noted to have um, these giant T wave inversions. But more recently, um, you know, I think as we discover this more and more, and this is discovered later, uh, only approximately 10 to 15% of these patients would be noted to have uh, these D T wave inversions or giant uh, T wave inversions. some epidemiology associated with this. This disease was first, uh, or this variant of the disease was first categorized in Japan uh, by Sakamoto um, and others. Uh, it was been kind of more frequently reported in Japan and is noted to be up to about 25% of all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cases in Japan, uh, whereas in the United States and the rest of the world, it can make a very much more smaller percentage, somewhere around the range of 3 to 10, 15%. Um, it seems to also affect males more frequently than females, um, also diagnosed later in life compared to the more classic variety, um, and also has a less strong association uh, with genetics and less associated with family history. And so the, as I was kind of going through before, the more kind of classic uh, diagnostic criteria was the just the configuration or the presence of this spade-like configuration on echo. Um, also with the presence of these giant T waves, uh, negative T waves in the lateral and uh, precordial leads on ECG. And then of course the uh, voltage criteria for um, LVH. But as we've kind of moved forward with more accurate um, Imaging, the focus has been on demonstrating a uh, wall thickness. So predominantly wall thickness in the LV apex uh, with a um, thickness of 15 millimeters or greater and a ratio of maximal apical to posterior wall thickness of one and a half. Um, and this is can be seen on either echo or cardiac MRI. And so although ECHO is kind of still the first line um, and kind of gold standard for diagnosing um, and evaluating uh, the phenotype of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, MRI is uh, becoming more and more useful, um, especially when maybe the apical windows are not um, as clear uh, on ECHO or there's some, you know, kind of uh, disagreement between the the presentation and the, the phenotype listed on the echo um, as more accurately being able to detect uh, both changes or differences in the regional myocardial wall thickness, the either in the septal, the distal septal, or the apical um, regions. It's also more sensitive at detecting apical aneurysms than echo um, and also um, helpful in kind of risk stratifying with scar burden as we kind of discussed with our patient earlier, the late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and so moving to kind of the risk stratification using the late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI, it's uh, so we discussed before indicative scar formation, ischemia, um, and also these are common in, in all varieties of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and a lot of studies have looked into this and uh, discovered its association with the severity of the hypertrophy as well as increased risk of development of heart failure um, and also sudden cardiac death. Uh, one recent study demonstrated that uh, if the presence of LGE comprises at least 15% or more of the LV mass, uh, there's at least a twofold increase in sudden cardiac death event risk. 
um, and an estimated likelihood for events of 6% at five years. And then furthermore, in this cohort that they studied of about approximately 1,300 patients, every 10% increase in LGE um, of the left ventricular myocardium was associated with a 40% increase in relative risk of sudden cardiac death events. And so for specifically for the apical uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy variety, the LG patterns are, as you would expect, characteristically in the apex. Um, they're also more subendocardial, um, and those, uh, that's kind of a pattern that's a little less common in typical or classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which has been kind of traditionally described as having patchy LG patterns um, and also more often involving regions of the RV insertion sites. Um, and of course, those areas in the um, classic variety where the wall thickness is greatest, like in the septum uh, and the upper septum. Um, and kind of a recent uh, kind of analysis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy registry data showed that in the apical variety, the LG presence was almost 50% um, in all subjects, and that aneurysms um, are considered the arrhythmogenic substrate, but perhaps the scar that um, occurs most, you know, more frequently is the uh, actual risk factor that poses the greatest risk of sudden cardiac death in these ventricular arrhythmias. Some pathophys uh, associated with the apical um, kind of configuration phenotype. There's typically no LV outflow obstruction, as you would imagine. Um, and so not a lot of uh, associated mitral regurge that's uh, involved with this disease. However, there are two phenomena that can kind of emerge more frequently in patients with uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, one being the midventricular obstruction with cavity, cavity obliteration. Um, and also, as we we're discussing before, apical aneurysm formation is uh, more common. Um, this can result in sudden cardiac death from scar formation. And as we were talking before, the substrate and kind of uh, um, the, the nidus for ventricular tachycardia is in VFib. So to briefly just talk about um, midventricular obstruction with cavity obliteration, obliteration. It's defined as the LV cavity obliteration during systole due to the large uh, LV mass in the apex, uh, decreases the overall cavity size. And when you have systole, you have a uh, complete obliteration up to the mid cavity level. Um, and in severe cases, this can last into diastole um, and cause a paradoxical diastolic jet flow. These are associated with also aneurysm formation as well. Um, and the aneurysm is defined as a discrete thin-walled akinetic or dyskinetic segment of the apex um, with a communication to the main cavity and diastole. It occurs in 2% of patients with the classic variety of hypertroph uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and approximately 13 to 15%, uh, maybe even a little higher, depending upon what studies um, you look at in the apical variety. Um, some of the hypothesis for the formation or the prevalence and formation of this is the uh, increased LV wall stress that occurs, uh, the high systolic pressures, uh, pressure overload, increased oxygen demands, impaired coronary perfusion, and just overall ischemia in that uh, apical area. And of course, this confers a higher risk of thrombus formation, stroke, uh, sudden cardiac death monomorphic VT, dis systolic dysfunction, and heart failure evolution. Um, and furthermore, in the absence of uh, epicardial, you know, coronary artery disease, microvascular dysfunction is a very known feature of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it's multifactorial. Uh, it's, you know, can deal with capillary density related to the large amount of um, myocardium that needs to be fed uh, and basically a mismatch in the capillary density there, the vascular remodeling that occurs, uh, the progressive interstitial fibrosis that is a consequence of all of this and myocyte disarray, 
and then just the just physical compression that occurs during um, um, uh, systole with the, all this ventricular hypertrophy and then the associated diastolic dysfunction. Um, there's actually been some more recent studies that have taken a look at the actual uh, kind of uh, perfusion associated in apical variety. Uh, a recent study showed cardiac MR stress testing on almost ubiquitous uh, apical ischemia and the apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, phenotype, and that this uh, myocardial blood flow was most, uh, mostly impaired in the subendocardial um, layer, which is where we see it in our gentleman here that we were just discussing earlier on the cardiac MRI. And of course, all of this was associated with uh, greater scar and apical aneurysm prevalence in this study. And so, you know, we, this disease used to be, you know, considered relatively benign, even when compared to the more classic forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, but more recent studies are kind of associating an increased rate of morbidity and mortality that's mostly associated with uh, the mixed form of this um, phenotype. So where we have not only the apical, significant apical hypertrophy, but the uh, septal, um, kind of distal septal wall hypertrophy that lends itself to the prevalence of uh, the um, midventricular uh, obstructive cavity obliteration um, and also apical aneurysm formation. Um, and so this mixed form tends to be more significantly associated with severe um, heart failure classification symptoms, um, more prone to developing left atrial enlargement and associated um, atrial fibrillation. They typically have higher BMP levels, uh, higher uh, troponin, resting troponin levels, and just overall um, increased mortality and morbidity. And so a breakdown of some of the just more common um, management uh, associated with the, this, this disease. So this is a comparison between the classical version, and apical version. So beta blockers are first line in both uh, phenotypes. Um, we also can uh, go to the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers as second line. Um, and of course, anticoagulation is um, uh, recommended in uh, atrial fibrillation, just you know, uh, irrelevant of uh, the chad vas score for both of these patient populations. Um, ablation, alcohol ablation is more common in the classical variety and the septal ablation um, variety. Uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's not as common. Um, ICD implantations, of course, there's a um, you know fairly well understood algorithm to um, implant in the classical variety, the apical variety, although there's, there's not a, um, a distinct pathway, we use some of the same risk factors associated in the, uh, classical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then there's also no, uh, septical myectomy in, um, the classical phenotype, um, is also a common, um, uh, therapy. Although in the apical variety, there's not a, not a lot of this um, reported. So as we were talking before, beta blockers are the initial drug of choice. It's uh, associated with decreased heart rate um, in response to exercise, decreased midventricular gradients with exercise, relief of angina by decreasing oxygen demand um, and improvement in diastolic filling. Also can be used to reduce the burden of NSVT um, and as said before, we can uh, go on to calcium channel blockers if not tolerated or not affected uh, from a beta blocker standpoint. Um, so discussing apical myectomy um, for patients with kind of refractory, you know, medic, I mean, uh, refractory symptoms even when on medication, um, the kind of aim of this is to to reduce the LV mass at the apex, um, to uh, kind of treat the increased diastolic dysfunction and um, the uh, smaller cavity size. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the LVOT 
um, obstruction may be treated with various drugs or surgeries, but in the apical variety, this is a little bit more difficult. Um, so the myectomy itself um, has, you know, even though it's not performed very often, it's uh, described as uh, an apical approach uh, performed through an incision by a standard sternotomy. Um, this is a, you have to go on bypass for this surgery. It involves resection of the myocardium. They try to get it to a level of uh, 10 to 12 millimeters um, after resection. And, uh, you know, even though this leaves a very small area of akinesis after the surgery, it doesn't, hasn't been reported to lead to any significant systolic uh, dysfunction. Um, as we said before, this is kind of reserved for patients that are uh, persistently symptomatic, even despite uh, maximal tolerated medical therapy. A recent study from the Mayo Clinic of about 115 patients um, showed that uh, there were no major complications associated with the surgery and had approximately a 70% improvement in NYHA functional class down to the one to two um, and had a survival uh, rated one, three, and five years of 95% and 81% um, for the three and five years, respectively. And so from the um, sudden cardiac death risk management uh, perspective, so the ICD implantation algorithm, as we discussed before, doesn't have a specific mention um, or, you know, kind of weight towards the apical phenotype um, and has been traditionally just kind of, you know, based on uh, the more classic morphology. Um, but as we said before, we can use other potential risk markers for sudden cardiac death that may be associated with the apical phenotype, which is the apical aneurysm, the cavity obliteration, uh, paradoxical diastolic flow jet. Um, and so, you know, the things in the Prior to all of these things that you know, come to light and been uh, associated as more powerful risk predictors, um, the apical variants um, were maybe a little bit, uh, you know, underrepresented or underutilized as far as ICD implantation, as they were often negative or lower scoring on the algorithm. They often had like a, a lower family history. Their um, their wall thickness uh, is typically never greater than three millimeters. It's uh, so a lot of those more classic uh, risk predictions that were used um, would would have not been met with the apical variants. And so some of the more recent updates um, that have occurred so recently in the AHA um, for implanting defibrillators as uh, primary prevention. Um, if you fulfill some of the risk factors, such as a uh, large burden of uh, late gadolinium enhancement on uh, cardiac MRI, comprising more than 15% of the LV mass, um, that would qualify as a, um, a significant risk factor. Also, the presence of a, uh, the apical aneurysm, um, independent of size, and also the regional scarring that occurs with the, uh, the presence of that late gadolinium enhancement all of those would um, you know, put you in the more high risk uh, for sudden cardiac death and consideration for uh, primary prevention, ICD implantation. And so the most recent algorithm, um, as we can see here, of course, for secondary prevention, ICD is recommended, but if no sudden cardiac death or VFib or sustained VT with um, hemodynamic instability, um, we would fall to the next level, which is a family history of sudden cardiac death, uh, massive LVH of three millimeter, or 30 millimeters, um, unexplained syncope, and now the apical aneurysm um, has been included as a, as a major risk factor, which would be a, a class 2A indication for ICD implantation. Um, and as we go down further on the list, we can see that the uh, cardiac MRI evaluation of uh, late gadolinium enhancement um, has also been included, um, so comprising over 15% uh, or more of the um, myocardium, then ICD may be considered as a 2B uh, indication for primary prevention. And so 
um, kind of conclusions of this case. So it's, you know, reading through all this is a very complex subset of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's very highly heterogeneous and both it's kind of um, phenotype, it's clinical and pathological profile. Um, it has a variable clinical course ranging from completely benign uh, with no, um, uh, you know, lifespan shortening or, you know, uh, significant morbidity all the way to high risk of sudden cardiac death and significant uh, heart failure and uh, refractory symptoms. Um, and so it's very important to uh, categorize the phenotype accurately and, uh, you know, monitor and, and discover some of these high risk features such, that, such as the aneurysm and um, scar uh, tissue um, presence. And in fact, another kind of uh, recommendation update in the AHA um, acknowledges that uh, this is, you know, apical hypertrophic variant puts you at risk for a uh, greater risk for development of aneurysm and myocardial scar that are all related to uh, these ventricular arrhythmias and uh, sudden cardiac death. And um, recommends that for patients with this, um, especially with this uh, variety, Cardiac MRI um, is a useful tool and should be uh, used on a periodic basis um, for SCD risk stratification, looking for these LGE uh, presence and other you know, significant changes such as development of apical aneurysm and increasing wall thickness. And so some quick future directions here, um, you know, I think going forward, looking at uh, the severity of these risk factors and the, um, you know, the benefit of primary prevention ICD implantation is certainly a, a, a very important, uh, you know, area of research that needs to continue to be ongoing. Also, I didn't really put this into the talk, but um, another thing that came up just reading through this, uh, re you know, this literature is the, um, perhaps the need for anticoagulation, even in empirically in these patients, uh, with large apical aneurysms and this, uh, you know, high degree of LVH in the apex uh, to mitigate the increased risk of um, thromboembolic phenomenon. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sash Deva, who was on CCU with me and um, went through this case together. Dr. Bloom, who was uh, associated with the EP and um, was very generous in her time in explaining all the, the risk associated with uh, this, this disease, and also Dr. Coley and Dr. Kumar, who contributed as well. And these are my citations associated with the presentation. That I'll open it up to comments. Stephen, thanks. That was an excellent review um, uh, of an important topic and sort of a as you, as you know, you sort of learned and alluded to sort of a sneaky uh, uh, clinical syndrome um, that can often go undetected for for years and years um, uh, in these patients. I um, one thing I wanted to add to your future directions. Um, you, know, you hit pretty much all the the salient points for this particular disease entity. But one thing also for future directions is the utility of, of Mavicampton mm -hmm. uh, in this. Yeah. Uh, we are in, currently enrolling in the Odyssey trial, which is Mavicampton for heart non-obstructive HCM patients who have at least some heart failure symptoms um, with preserved ejection fraction and the utility of that drug in that particular um, patient population. So there may yeah. be just improving diastolic function and and uh, et cetera, uh, a, a role for that for that um, particular medication, particularly for symptom improvement um, in the future. One quick question I had. So, what's striking about this case to me, um, actually, you know, usually how these types of patients are, and you alluded to this, are diagnosed is they is they almost to a man or a woman have very striking electrocardiograms. And that's yeah. frequently how they're diagnosed. Um, this guy was diagnosed because he's having VT, which is another way they're diagnosed, but but a little more atypical. Usually these patients, the sort of classic story is, yeah, I was 
32 years old and I was going in because I needed, you know, like my, my knee, I had going in for elective surgery on my knee or, you know, whatever. And they did an EKG and the next thing I know I'm in the cath lab <laughs> so, getting my coronary shot, you know, they told me I was having a heart attack, even though I felt fine, blah, blah, blah. So that's how they get diagnosed. This guy's EKG is relatively unimpressive. I, I do. Did we have old EKGs av available? Do you remember? Did this guy have like, particularly from like years ago on this guy? I wonder is that what I'm thinking potentially is if he has so much scar now at his apex, because a right. lot of times it's that apical hypertrophy that really shows up um, right. on, you know, really makes a very distinct impression on the surface EKG, even more so than the septal patients. Right, right. Septal patients can often have, but they these folks with the, eight, you know, I always say the, the, the closer the LVH is to the apex, the more striking the EKG is. Um, but this guy's, you know, he's got some changes, but nothing like we typically see. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I, I could not find anything going back further than just maybe a year and a half to two years. I think he had, at some point had been in the process private world for some of his care. Um, and so that may have been why we don't have, yeah, I would theorize it, it was potentially yeah, more striking in the past and right. it's just become muted evolved over time. Yeah. Right. That, now that he's just scarred out, scarring out his, his apex. Uh, yep. over yeah. And, and, and going back to your point about the, the Mavic camp tonight, look through some of that and, and, you know, the, the Maverick trial, which I guess is kind of ongoing, mm -hmm. the phase two version, I wondered, I, I couldn't find any mention if there was any subcategory that um, in, in their enrollment, how many uh, of the apical ver you know, variants were enrolled in that. But I know just, you know, from a non-obstructive uh, physiology pattern, pattern in the, in the improvement in symptoms and the improvement in the biomarkers such as BMP and troponin levels and that kind of thing that were associated. I, I yeah, I, I got to believe that hopefully that will be a, uh, a successful, you know, kind of. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think they're going to do a, a trial specifically for apical, but right, right. do a non-obstructive HCM patients, uh, you know, significant proportion of them right. are, are going to be in this subcategory. So right. I, other questions, comments from the, from the audience. Good morning, Steve. This was a great talk. I have Dr. Clemens right next to me and he wants to ask you a question. Sure. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Hey, good morning, Dr. Clements. So uh, this is uh, one of my favorite, favorite things. Robbie knows this favorite patient of mine has taught me so much about this. I'll say about the EKG. Sometimes, uh, or every time she comes in, her EKG is read as acute MI. If she goes in the hospital, uh, it'll be read as an acute MI and uh, everybody else all excited. If you go back to that tracing. Did we lose you, Dr. Clements? Oslem, Dr. Clements, we, I think we lost you. We lost your audio. Let me look and see if they got muted accidentally. Okay, got you back. Oh, yeah, hey, you're, gotcha. back. you're back. I say the EKG will be called acute MI by the computer and it'll cause everybody to get all excited, start drawing components and et cetera. So um, some of those original cases in the Yamaguchi paper uh, have SC segment elevation before the T waves take a dive. It causes one of the most unusual looking EKGs you'll ever see. So, uh, that's remarkable. And the EKG is a key to making this diagnosis. I think uh, uh, Ankit Bhargava, who I'm looking at right now, told me that he's identified hundreds of patients at the Cab General <laughs> 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 that have this entity. <laughs> or maybe not, maybe not hundreds, but close to it. <laughs> uh, you, you get it mixed up with uh, patients on dialysis that have concentric hypertrophy from, from that. And uh, they have these kind of EKGs similar to it. So you have to separate those out. Right. So uh, now that original tracing you showed with the VT. Yes. So every time I see a tracing like that, I always ask myself, from whence did that focus come? So if you look at that electrical axis, you know, it's negative in two, three and AVF. So it's up in the air. 
and the transition is relatively early. And the EP guys will tell you where it's coming from. So it looks like to me, I mean, I'm not sure where it's coming apex. from, but is it coming from the apex? From the apex. I promise you. Was that where it was ablated? So no. this patient was not taken for ablation. It didn't, um, didn't do ablation. That's right. Okay, that's great. Okay. So uh, when, when you are faced with that kind of tracing in the emergency room, you have to be careful with the, with the defibrillator. Mm. Because if you just put the paddles on it and defibrillate them, you wind up with V-fib and you have mm. to shock again. Well, you know, that's all right. <laughs> but you should always sink it. And when you sink the defibrillator, you have to remember that you don't, do a quick push down with the button you have to hold it down until the qrs comes now it comes pretty quickly here mm -hmm. and uh you have to have to make sure you sink otherwise if you do a quick push you think the machine is not and this is applicable to to uh rates that are slower you think the machine is malfunctioning so uh, you have to remember that when you're sinking and uh, pushing the button so uh I really couldn't see that arteriogram well, but one way to diagnose that in the calf lab is watch for that septal squeeze, which I think your patient had, mm. uh, but I, I couldn't quite see that. The septal and apical yeah, septal perforators get squeezed, and that's the way you diagnose it on the arteriogram before you shoot the ventricular gram and see the spade sign. You do, you do see a little bridging, Steve, if you look like sort of those distal. Yeah, like, you watch yeah, those uh, septal perforators that get squeezed. That's right. So uh, that, that's the way you diagnose that in the cath lab. Mm -hmm. um, and this business about the echo contrast, when you really can't see the ventricular endocardium well mm -hmm. from the apical views, you can miss this a whole lot. And that's where contrast comes in. And that'll show you the apical pouches and the apical, um, apical hypertrophy, uh, like Osman's showing me now. And uh, that little contrast trick uh, will take you well beyond all others who are looking at those patients when you have an EKG that's not as dramatic as yours was. So... Uh, I am hopeful that Meva Captan will have some role in this. And I keep asking Oslam that, and she gives me some sort of equivocal answer. <laughs> <laughs> but she actually tells me that maybe on the horizon, and uh, I'm looking at it right now, do we have a clinical trial in the future? Here she is right here. We do have multiple. We do have a mm -hmm. lot of phase two studies, which are very promising. And the phase three is going to be enrolling soon. We're going to be a site for it, actually. So if you have any more patients, Dr. Awesome. Clemens, send them on our way. Okay, that's it. Yeah, it was a great talk, Steve. Just Thank one you. more um, comment. You mentioned about the microvascular ischemia is very common in patients with apical okay. hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is very true. Mm -hmm. There was actually a very nice paper came out recently. They took a bunch of apical ATM patients who were at various parts of the disease spectrum. Mm -hmm. And they did a cardiac pet for all of them. That's right. And yeah. every single cardiac pet was abnormal. And yeah, it that did was... not correlate with epicardial coronary artery disease. Um, so if somebody is suspecting of, you know, any epicardial coronary artery disease, it's important to, to take a look at the anatomy rather than ordering functional evaluation. Mm. That's a very good point. Why are you having to move? All right. Yeah, I mean, we could talk. Uh, Neil Dicker raises his hand. Dr. Dicker. I got to raise my hand for something. You know, we got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, sure. So, so two, two, two related questions, but um, I'm curious. You mentioned at the very end being a little unclear about, uh, you know, the thresholds for anticoagulation. I would be interested in your or others on the calls thoughts about anticoagulation in this patient with a defined apical aneurysm, um, you know, acknowledging the, the fact that we don't have huge data. I guess, appended to that question, I'm curious, it's interesting when you think about Mevacampton as, as helping with regard to symptomatic disease and whatnot, you do wonder if it might have a special role in these patients in helping to prevent aneurysm formation that would be obviously very difficult to study because um, it's a small population, but I'd be curious as to whether um, you know, the, the, the thoughts on that as a prospect for helping to prevent aneurysm progression or formation. 
Yeah, yeah. you know, there are some, uh, as far as, so just to going towards the, the anticoagulation, there are some very small um, studies uh, yeah. you know, that, that have looked into this. Um, and, and there certainly seems to be a very, very high association with uh, thrombus formation in the uh, just particularly in the patients that have the apical aneurysm associated with this phenotype. Um, and so, you know, I think from just gathering as if we're talking about just a risk stratification and this specific patient in this specific phenotype, um, I mean, uh, uh, luckily for, for us in this particular gentleman, the, the answer is already, uh, I mean, the question's already answered with the history of AFib. He was already on anticoagulation, but I, I think I would, you know, certainly be a risk benefit talk with the patient, but I think I would be fairly aggressive yeah. um, in, in going ahead and just empirically treating with anticoagulation. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, as far as the Mavic Hampton, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think all that, is, you know, cavity obliteration, the, the high diastolic dysfunction, uh, aneurysm formation, I think uh, certainly, I think that I, I would hope that this is going to be a, a positive outcome as far as the trials are concerned and, and the role of Mavicampton as a medication. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, just for the aneurysm thing, the, the short answer is the bigger the, that apical aneurysm, the more likely we are to anticoagulate. I mean, just, you know, just that being a variable, it's, it's obviously easy when you, and for, sometimes we do see thrombus in the aneurysm, particularly on MRI. Obviously that makes the decision a little bit easier too. But as Steve said, a lot of these folks have concomitant atrial fibrillation. So it makes that a little bit easier as well. And then, yeah, as well as Mavicampton seems to be working for our obstructed patients, I, I got to assume it will translate, you know, uh, whether as to the same degree, who knows, but it's it's a very effective drug at anything, any problems that seem to be caused by um, hypercontractility, um, which, you know, we think a lot of the problems in this condition, and also it seems improved diastolic function, uh, at least in theory. So I, we're we're very hopeful it will have a role in this population as well. All right. Well, very good. The other last thing I'll say is Steve's talk highlighted as well, the importance of cardiac MRI in this population. I mean, it's important for all patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but gosh, so important in this group to see the aneurysm clearly if they have it, you know, the importance of scar and risk stratifying because these patients in my experience will almost never, ever get to that three centimeter cutoff. That is almost mm -hmm. always a septal phenomenon. I can't remember ever seeing an apex get to three centimeters. So that's sort of out the window in terms of their risk factors. So really the, the scar and, and presence of aneurysm that obviously ambulatory monitoring for VT is really what it comes down to in this patient population, this particular subset. So, all right. Well, I want to thank Steve again for an excellent review on a very interesting patient population, an interesting case. Uh, thanks, Steve. And we'll see everybody next week for our last Friday conference of the year. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.